That was awesome. If you couldn't feel the spirit moving in that, I feel sorry for you, but it really, it really touched my heart. Thank you all so much. Uh, we're just uh, really thankful for the joyful giving. As we know, the Lord loves a joyful giver. And we need uh, more joyful givers because uh, we're behind. We, um, we're about $22,000. Not under budget, but we had to move that much money from our reserve in order to operate for the past five and a half months. And just uh, ask y'all to be prayerful about what you're given so that we don't f generate a shortfall and, and uh, end up having to cut Tim's pay. <laughs> but I uh, know we're just thankful for what you do. We're thankful for the MOP program that God answered our prayers in that. And uh, just remember, he loves a joyful giver. Uh, nothing out of the ordinary in the announcements. There's a copy of this in each foyer. If you're visiting with us, please fill out a guest card. There's one in each foyer. And uh, we're glad to hear you, have you here. Um, a lot of people may or may not know Carl. Can't remember Carl's last name now. But he's gonna turn 92 tomorrow. Still up and running. Uh, my lovely wife, she turned 99 the day before yesterday. Oh, wait, 66, I'm sorry. Uh, so um, we're just thankful for everybody worshiping. There's a young man sitting in the front row at church, and he was getting a little bit fidgety. And the uh, pastor called him out on it and said, uh, Son, can you tell me God's name? And he said, yes, sir. He says, what is it? He says, it's Andy. What? It's Andy. God's name is Andy. So where would you hear that? He said, I heard you say it a while ago. I heard you sing it. Andy walks with me. Andy talks with me. Andy. <laughs> I'm moving on to a communion. Some years back, I'm, I met twice a week with an accountability brother, and we'd have breakfast at gyms, and typically we'd sit in about the same area. In those days, there was a smoking area in the back, and so we sat, like, outside. But um, he called me one day and said, Brad, I'm not going to make it. I forgot I got to do a blood test. I got I to go for a blood test today. I have to fast. I said, okay. I, I was already in there sitting down. And the waitress came from smoking area and walked over to me and she says I I know you're a Christian man because I see you and your friend praying and I ask you to pray for my 16 year old daughter she's going to cheerleader camp and she set a picture down in front of me and she said I just want to pray for her safety and so I told her to sit down I reached across the table I held her hand I prayed for her daughter prayed for her safety prayed for her mother's peace and went on about my day and two or three months later, she came to me and she said, I just want to thank you for praying for my daughter. She said, everything went fine. She said, but you know, there was like three or four tables in there full of men doing Bible studies. And she says, I went to each one of them and asked them to pray for my daughter. She says, but you were the only one that did. She says, I don't know if they prayed for her later on, but I know you did. And it, uh, it affected me somewhat to know that when you're asked to pray, you should pray. And strangely enough, I remember that incident when I got this devotion from one of my friends who is a recovering alcoholic. He's my age and he's had, had a drink since he was 28 years old. And now he uses the power of the Holy Spirit to counsel others that are struggling. And he sent me this and it says, when we say to people, I will pray for you, we make a very important commitment. 
The sad thing is, is that remark often remains nothing but a well-meant expression of concern. But when we learn to descend with our mind into our heart, then all those who have become part of our lives are led into the healing presence of God and touched by Him in the center of our being. When we are speaking here about a mystery for which words are inadequate, it is the heart mystery that the heart which is in the center of our being is transformed by God into His own heart, a heart large enough to embrace the entire universe. Through prayer, we can carry in our heart all human pain, sorrow, conflict, agony, torture, war, hunger, loneliness, and misery, not because of some great physiological or emotional capacity, because God's heart has become one with ours. I find that very interesting to know that the heart of the Lord can embrace the entire universe. And since we share that same heart with Him, we need to practice that in prayer whenever we are called to do so. On the night in which He was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took the bread, and He broke, broke it, and He passed it. He did this as an example of his body, which he was about to give on the cross for the forgiveness of sin. And he said, take and eat. This is my body given to you. And in the same manner, he passed the cup, saying, take and drink. This represents my blood. He shed it for us. And he did it. If only one of us was there, he would have done the same sacrifice. Would y'all pray with me? Father, just uh, so thankful for your generous provisions and your incredible love for us. And I thank you for the heart of this worship team up here that just uh, absolutely captivated me with your presence. And Lord, I just ask you to bless Tim as he comes forward and to bless each one of us with the ears to hear and the heart to receive what it is you want to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Good to have uh, Delane and John back from their vacation in the cool mountains of Colorado, right? It looked beautiful. I wasn't envious at all. I know quite a few people are on vacation trying to escape the heat. Uh, Esther went to Montana. So it was so hot there, 90 degrees. I was like, <laughs> um, Please continue to be in prayer for um, Robert, uh, you know, Robert and Lulu Robert. Um, Monday was an exciting day for me because everyone was going to the ER. Um, <laughs> Michelle called me and, or texted me and said, he's going to the ER by ambulance. And I'm like, oh, gosh. But he, he um, was dehydrated from the flu or something like that, right? And it was not life-threatening or serious, but thank God for that. And um, right before I got that one, I got a call from Lulu that she was taking Robert to the ER with severe um, abdominal pain. And uh, so he spent you know, most of the day in the ER, them trying to figure out what was wrong, and Finally, they transferred him to North Central Baptist, and he was just having excruciating pain. It took him until that evening to figure out that, um, well, there's a doctor here, and I'll probably mess the whole thing up, but there's an artery that goes through your stomach down into the bowel area, and as a result of high blood pressure, 
that thing had frayed. And um, the vascular surgeon came and she, we were sitting there and she said, that vessel is too small for me to go and repair, but we've got to get the blood pressure. And so he spent all week in the ICU before they could get the blood pressure under control. But um, I just got a text from Lulu saying that um, they're just waiting for a room in the surgical ward um, because they think they've got the blood pressure, but they've got to monitor this um, condition. So please be in prayer for them. Um, uh, Robert's been going through one thing after another, and um, uh, I know he wants to get out. He, I got a note yesterday. He got his first real breakfast. And it was like the best thing in life. And I'm like, you know you've had some trouble recently. If you ate a hospital breakfast and considered it one of the finest moments of your life. <laughs> you know? I mean, hospital anything. But, yeah. So, uh, be in prayer for them. Um, so last week... We looked at the fruit of the Spirit. Now remember, and if you weren't here the last couple of weeks, just go watch online on Facebook or YouTube because you're going to see how he's building this progression in which we understand that the Christian life is not something we do, but something he does in and through us. The works of the flesh, that's what we do. <laughs> that's what we produce. But the fruit of the Spirit is what we bear. We don't bear it from our own ability, our own talents, our own giftedness. We bear it because we have received the very life of Jesus Christ so that we live in him and he lives in us so that he can bear fruit through us. Now, it was a wonderful song selection, but I wondered how many people were lying at different points in their singing. Have you ever thought about what we sing? And you guys have to practice it. I'm like, wow, if you're on the worship team, you better get right with God, man. So one of the things that, that said that I thought was so powerful, it was like, he changes what I see and he changes what I seek. Isn't that powerful? Because if, you don't, if you're not conscious and intentional, you can just go through life just doing life. But when you're living out of life from him, he really does begin to open our eyes to see what has eternal value. And he gives us a passion to seek what pleases him, not just going through life seeking our own pleasures. And so... The manifestation of his life living through us looks like Jesus. It looks like love because love is the foundation for God who is love. When he bears his life through us, first looks like love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and kindness and goodness and a life that is controlled by the Spirit. A life that is no longer self-seeking, but a life that desires to be an expression. So the answer to all of the struggles that we're in and face is simply to walk in the Spirit. He says, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lustful desires of the flesh. Don't focus on the works of the flesh and try to eliminate them. Acknowledge them. Repent of them. And renew your heart to walk in step with him. So today we're going to cover three whole verses um, and close out chapter number five. 
And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Father, I pray that you would develop in our body, those who are here and listening online, Lord, that you would just build with uh, in us a passion, a hunger, a burning desire to experience life with you and your life transforming us into your image where we experience and others experience what it is to see your spirit moving and manifesting in our lives. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So he starts off and he says, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So really it's coming down to this basic question. Are you in Christ? Those who belong to Christ, think about that. Those who belong to Christ. What does that mean? To, uh, uh, we were talking at some point. We were talking about, okay, you get saved. Yeah, that's what it was in Sunday school. You, we got to get people saved. And then and we started talking about that thing. But sometimes I don't even think that it really describes the whole what it means, right? You say, to, to, to belong to Christ is to come and recognize that in my sin and separation from God, that he went to the cross to pay the price I couldn't pay. He pays and takes all of my sin unto himself and redeems me. Well, to be redeemed means to be bought out of slavery. So you can't really get saved uh, unless you're recognizing that you were enslaved to sin. Why do sinners sin? Well, they were born that way. Listen, uh, yesterday I was playing in the pool most of the afternoon with my two and six-year-old grandson. And, you know, I love it when people have their first little child and they're going, oh, it's an angel, an angel. I want you to know that a two and six-year-old, they are angels. They're fallen angels. They're terrorists. I mean, they are unending balls of energy with no empathy for the aged. <laughs> See, you don't have to teach a kid to sin because they're born in Adam. They're a slave to sin. They're slave. Be, uh, they, they, they don't have really any choice to sin. They're going to sin in one way or the other. The best that we can do is to manage their sin. And that's why religion becomes so toxic and painful is because religion in the, in, because religion can be used in a very good sense, but, but I'm using religion as a manner of, of way to modify behavior so that people can see themselves as good. Right, here's a list of things to do and not do. So we see ourselves as good, and so we don't really need uh, the abundance of God's grace because we, we're pretty good. But he's saying, if you're in Christ, if you belong to Christ, you recognize that you were a slave to sin. He redeemed you, which means he bought you, and you are no longer your own. Who do you belong to? How many of us live as those who belong to Christ. You don't want to talk about it? <laughs> well, I mean, nothing changes in our lives until we start letting ourselves ask the important questions. Because you can go to church your whole life and you can know all kinds of information and you can live what is considered to be a good life and never experience 
what it is to be a beloved child of God and to belong to him. Because in our Western mindset, we think the best thing for us is to be independent. Well, politically speaking, you know, I mean, independence and freedom and all that, that's, that's marvelous. We, we should be thankful that, for that. Because I've lived in communist countries and it's not so great. But let me tell you this. Spiritually speaking, we are not designed to be independent. In fact, independence is what the essence of the first sin was all about. We were created to be in relationship with God, fully dependent upon him, and the sin of Adam and Eve was choosing to be like God and independent to be their own God, knowing good and evil, but he designed us for dependence, and we're healthy and whole when we're living out of a relationship where we realize that we belong to Jesus, and because we belong to him, what happened to him happened to us. So he comes to the earth as man to model for us how to live in dependence of the Father. He goes to the cross and he becomes sin for us that we might be made righteous. And he takes us to the cross so that we might be crucified. He takes us to the grave so that we are buried. He raises us up again with him so that we can have a newness of life, a resurrection life. And after 40 days, he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. And that's where we are now, in him. So that answers the whole debate about whether you can lose your salvation or will you go to heaven when you die? Let me tell you. If you are the author of your salvation, you probably lost it three times this morning on the way to church. If he is the author of your salvation, if he bought you and you belong to him, you don't have to worry about going to heaven when you die because you're already there. So he's telling us now, now we... We belong to Christ. What have we done? We have crucified the flesh. And you're like, I don't remember that. Because it wasn't your physical body that was crucified. Because we have a God who is eternal, and he lives outside of our 24-hour day. Seven days a week, 365 days a year, except for leap year. And then, you know, and everything for us is time so a lot of things come to us as a surprise because we are stuck in a time relationship god is outside of time so he sees the future as well as he sees the past he knows who would belong to him and he made them one with his son and so what he's saying here isn't that this is a possibility. He's making or, or stating a fact. In the Greek, it's in the eros tent. So it says, he goes, this points us back to a one-time action that has an ongoing effect. So the moment that you entrusted yourself to the finished work of the cross, the moment that became the reality of your life and you belong to him and he li you live in him and he lives in you, from that moment to the very end, you crucified the flesh. You crucified not only the flesh, but the passions and desires of the flesh. The flesh, the self-life. Now, I know what you're thinking is, well, then why do I still get tempted? Very important lesson to learn here. He did not say that the flesh, the passions and desires of the world are crucified. He said your relationship to it completely changed. 
Okay, here's the deal. Um, funerals. Now, we don't do funerals anymore. We do celebrations of life. That's how much things have changed. I remember when I was first in ministry, I was doing funerals just to survive because uh, the, my salary was so low with four kids, I couldn't even, you know, buy diapers. And so there was like three funeral homes in Long Beach, California, and lots of really old people. And so I went around to the different funeral homes and said, I am available to do funerals for anyone who doesn't have a pastor. So this is crazy, right? So like Vanessa's like, we need diapers. So I'd be on my knees, Lord, please let someone die. <laughs> please let someone die who doesn't know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so at the funeral, right? Now we say the celebration of life. What are we saying? If we're truly believers and understanding, we're celebrating the physical life that we had with this person. But what we're saying is that that person has never been more alive because now they're free from this earth suit that causes us pain. Uh, an earth suit that can get dehydrated and make you go to the hospital in an ambulance. Cause great trauma to your spouse. Uh, we have an earth suit that can be affected by high blood pressure like Robert and create long hospital stays, right? I mean, we have an earth suit that can have all kinds of problems. And then when we go to heaven, we're free from that messed up earth suit. But we're still alive. So when we talk about death, what we're not talking about is the end of the existence of someone. We're just saying that the soul, the spirit, have a completely new relationship to the physical earth suit. So here Paul tells the church at Galatia, he said, now you're alive in Christ, but you crucified the flesh, its desires. It's sinful passions and desires. It doesn't mean that you're never going to have uh, sinful passions and desires because the tempter is always going to bring around and try to lead you back to walk after the flesh, to follow after sinful passions and desires. But he says, you got to remember, you crucified Mean you have a whole new relationship to those sinful desires because you belong to Christ. So when the tempter comes, when the temptation comes, we say, that's not who I am. That doesn't fit who Christ has made me to be. I used to sin because I was a sinner. But now I'm a saint. Why am I a saint? because they belong to him. Think about it. Even in the Old Covenant and Old Testament, right, when they would bring an offering and they placed it on the altar, it was called sanctified, holy. What made it holy? It belonged to God. It was God's possession. See, what I'm trying to get you to the place is to realize that sin and temptation are alive and well. But you're dead to it. You have a new relationship to it. No one can make you sin. You get a, a, a covetous, a lustful thought that pops into your mind, some, you know, idolatrous uh, seeking and what do you do well you don't follow after it you say listen I, I, that's false advertising i belong to god i have christ living in me and because i have christ living in me all of my needs have been satisfied all of my needs have been met he's given me his own life i'm a partaker of the divine nature and because he lives in me and i live in him i can say what would we say no when he says no we sang some crazy stuff we sang some stuff like we really realize I belong to God and I'm not my own and he's the Lord and master of my life. And it was all true. 
But are you experiencing that? I mean, are you really in connection and communion and relationship with your Abba so that when he says no, you go, no. When he says wait, you wait. When he calls you, are you really diving in? There's nothing wrong with that song. Don't get me wrong. I'm not making fun of the song. I'm making fun of us. Because I want us to wake up to become a people who that song is our reality. That song is our experience. But how can it be your experience if you don't ever hear them? And so it's important to realize that this is about a relationship, an intimacy that surpasses anything that the world has to offer you. And you belong to him and he lives in you. But it's not enough to know. He says, I want you to experience this as your reality. In Galatians 2.20, we looked at this a few weeks ago, maybe a year ago, I don't remember, but I have been crucified with who? Okay, so I, he's personalized. He says, I want you to personalize it. So speak this with me, okay? You're supposed to shake your head, yes. Because this is how we get done early. When I ask a question, you respond, and then I don't have to repeat myself, okay? So, I have been crucified with Christ. What's the next one? It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. See, Paul wasn't speaking that for himself. He was speaking that for everyone who was in that church because he wanted them to realize that his life was to be the same experience as them. I don't want you to come. I mean, I want everyone to come to church. I want the place to be packed and full again. But I'm just saying, listen, not just to know more, but to really experience what it means to belong to God, to know that I am not a slave to sin. I live. I live because Christ is not just a savior who takes me to heaven when I die. Christ is my life, the source. He gave me everything I need for this life and all godliness. I don't need it. I'm not lacking anything. I have it. And life is now to live by faith. Faith and faith has its source in God's word. Faith is I hear God, I follow God. He says yes, I say yes. He says go, he, I go. He says give, I give. I just live in harmony with Him. You know that. Okay, so we transfer twenty two thousand dollars, but. Ooh, you don't know that stuff. All you need to do is say, Lord, what do you want me to give? And give it. We'll be fine. If all of us just hear God and do what God wants to, that's freedom. It's not compulsion. It's like God says give and we get to cheerfully give what God belongs to God, not us, because it's not really ours to begin with. The person who's stingy and has a hard time giving doesn't get it. Because you know what? They're trying to get something that belongs to me. I ain't going to let that preacher or them elders tell me what to give. I ain't what to do. But we're missing out on the fact that everything I am, all that I am, I belong to. So everything that is in my stewardship, in my possession, belongs to who? So actually, when he tells me to give, what am I doing? I'm giving his money the way he wants me to give it. Amen, that's good preaching. Thank you, Pastor. That's really good. Yeah. You see, friends, 
to be crucified with him is to understand that our spirit is united to Christ. So that what happened to him happened to us. I was a slave to the flesh. I sinned because I was born a sinner. But now I'm a saint. So sinning doesn't suit what I used to be. But you won't live this out if you think of yourself as a sinner who's saved by grace. There used to be, I went through a phase in my life when I listened to quartet music. My wife's really glad I got over it. But I used to listen to quartet music all the time. I love it. I mean, I can still sing some of those songs, you know. Anyways, but there was this song years ago, and it was like, you know, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, you know. And it sounded awesome, but it's just theologically under, it, it's wrong. You see, if all I am is a sinner saved by grace, it sounds kind of humble. But as long as I'm still a sinner by nature, sin will be the only natural outcome. I can go to certain churches and learn to change my sins, but sinning will always be there. What Paul's saying is that, hey, you were a sinner and I bought you out. And I bought you to myself and I made you holy because I put my life in you and the spirit of God is in you. So now you're a completely new person with a completely new way of living. And what he desires to do in and through me is my best. You know, we, we struggle because we don't really understand the nature of God because we think, well, if I fully surrendered myself to God, he might want me to do things that I don't want to do. That might be true. That might be true if, you're, if you haven't begun to experience the joy of knowing he desires what's best for you. I think I know what's best for me, but I'm almost always wrong. Because I, my, my knowledge, my insight, my discernment is finite. But the one who lives in me has a wisdom that is infinite. A love that is unending. I mean, think about it. He knew everything about me and still chose me. Like, I had this thought. <laughs> and I was like, like, how many people would sit next to someone if that movie screen thing that I talked about last week was true? You're like, if you know every sinful action or attitude the person you were sitting next to, including your spouse, had ever thought or done, you wouldn't want to sit next to them, and they wouldn't want to sit next to you. I think that's why some of you sit so far apart. <laughs> Listen, God knew it all. And he said, I love you. I love you enough to give my life for you so I can live in you. Now all I want to do is live through you so that people can experience me being expressed through you. Sin, it isn't dead. It's alive and well. You're dead to it. You have a whole new relationship to it. Doesn't mean you can't sin. It means it is foreign to you. It is a freak of nature. You see, what happens to us is we begin to accept and make excuses for our sinful actions and attitudes. We do. We were talking about it in Sunday school, but we I talked about it in first service, and I've mentioned the, the concept before, but how many of you have buttons that can be pushed? Right? One of my buttons that I'm dealing with right now is traffic. Okay? 
I'm played golf in comfort. I'm driving home. There are two 18-wheelers on I-10 drag racing at 50 miles an hour <laughs> up the hill. There's a mile-long backup. They keep in perfect harmony up the hill, down the hill, up the hill. I am about to lose it. I'm beginning to think really bad words. I am not blessing them. And I said, Lord, I am very impatient with this. And I, I promise you, it was like he said to me, it's not bothering me at all. He goes, why don't you just relax? Because I might be saving you from yourself. Because you know what my temptation is always? As soon as one of them pulls over, I slam on the gas. I go 90, 95 to make up all of my lost time. And inevitably, there's going to be a state trooper right over the hill, right? You see, when I'm impatient, the answer isn't, Lord, give me more patience. The answer is, Lord, you are my patience. And because I belong to you and you're one with me, you're everything I need. Now, we almost all have some kind of button that someone knows how to push. And we, we, we make the excuse for ourselves. We rationalize our sinful responses to someone pushing our buttons because... Why not? They shouldn't push our buttons. Instead of saying, Lord, I'm your beloved child and I belong to you. The question is, why do I have this button? Lord, what do you want to heal that's behind this button? Because I crucify my flesh all of its passions and desires. They're alive, but my relationship to them is severed. Are you hearing me? He said, this is what we have in him. To live is now Christ, who is my life, living through me. So we must be intentional to renew our minds to remind ourselves of the truth that we have been now crucified, that our relationship to sin, to the flesh, is completely dealt with in Christ, and we are no longer slaves to those sins. We, when, he, when he shows us the buttons or the attitudes or actions that don't look like Jesus or sound like Jesus, we simply say, I am free. Paul tells us that, when, that the only way we're going to experience transformation is to renew our minds. Okay, one of the other things we were singing, I really love this one. I'm not going to let feelings run my life anymore. Did you guys sing that? Do you, do you remember singing that? Oh, were you out, Deborah? <laughs> we were singing. How does that slide go? Someone pop that up for me. I feeling, uh, I'm not chasing feelings. I'm, I'm what? So, if this is a Catholic church, we'd have to have a confessional. I'm not chasing feelings. What am I doing? I'm keeping in step with the Holy Spirit no matter how I feel at that moment. Because feelings are good. I mean, I like good feelings. Feelings are an important part of how God structured us. But chasing a feeling or following our feelings is dangerous. 
Romans 6, 5 and 6 says, For if we have been united with him in, in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. It means made powerless. Are you hearing it? Because you're in Christ, because he bought you and lives in you, sin is out there, temptation is out there, passions are out there, but they've been made powerless over you because of who you are in Christ. You don't have to react. As long as you make excuses for your buttons being pushed. Now, my favorite one is to blame the people who push my buttons because that releases me of all responsibility it, they should not push my buttons. But the reality is, for me to say that means I'm saying I am a slave to someone else. Someone else other than God is the master over my emotions and reactions. And that makes that person an idol that I serve out of resentment. I know that was good preaching. I gotta get me a button or something that affirms me. <laughs> what he wants us to see is, he says, listen, I took you out and I grafted you in. You did not belong to Christ. You weren't in him because I grafted you into the very divine life. The tie that, that kept you bound by sinful choices and desires has been broken. Romans 6, 7 says, For one who has died has been set free from sin. See, don't buy the lie that you're a slave. Don't buy the lie that you're in lack. Don't be buy the lie that you're in need. Israel, the, that came out of the uh, slavery in Egypt, never entered into the promised land because they never lost their slave mindset. They could never enter into being sons. I don't want us to be a group of genuine believers hungering to live out discipleship and still live like slaves. Romans 6, 10, 11 says, for the death he died, he died to sin. How many times? Every Sunday morning and Sunday night, Wednesday night. How many times did he die? It says, once for all. The perfect high priest with the perfect sacrifice went to the cross to set you free. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin. Who has to do it? You have to do it. Now listen, you'd think we'd know these things and just we'd never forget. Now, part of my Parkinson's is short-term memory loss, cognitive decline. So everything gets blamed on Parkinson's. I went to HEB. I went to HEB, and I was going to buy four things that I needed to make dinner. I went into HEB without a list. I came out of HEB with seven things and two of the things that were on my mind to buy which means I had to go back into HEB to get the two things that were originally on the things, and I don't know why I got the other things. So now, Vanessa sends me, she has this thing app on her phone, like a note, and she sends me this text with note, and it says HEB, or the other one says Costco, and I open it, and I click on it, and I go down the list. You know how many times I've been across H-E-B from one side to the other to realize that I've forgotten something that was already on the list and had to go all the way back to the vegetable section because I forget. You 
frequently forget what Christ has done for you, to you, and desires to do with you. So wake up every morning and remind yourself whose you are. Have notes on your car and your desk and all over the place that tell you truths that remind you that you are free, that you are dead to sin, that you are alive to God. Friends, Jesus' death wasn't a tragic mistake it was a purposeful death he died to sin once for all so that we could be free but this has to become an intentional decision that becomes actionable in our lives or nothing changes and i don't want us to live that kind of life he says if we live by the spirit let us also keep in step with the Spirit. But don't think if, like it's conditional clause, it's only if based on, if you're in Christ and you belong to Christ, then it's since. So since we are led by the Spirit, let's just stay in step with the Spirit. And when someone pushes a button and we're activated, we say, thank you, Jesus, for shining this in my my view so I can reckon it for what it is and it's foreign to me and it doesn't belong, it doesn't fit with me, it doesn't suit me, it's not who you made me to be. I'm free, I'm dead to it. I'm alive unto God. I get a little out of step of, in the spirit and the way I, I think or the way I act and he says, just, just get back in step because we're one We've been given a relationship of harmony, of union, that's to impact every other relationship. Keep in step with the Spirit. Colossians, he mentions, you know, walk a worthy walk. Walk in a manner that's worthy of your calling, seeking only what is pleasing. Finally, he closes it out and he said, let us not be conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Conceited is simply to think and value yourself more than you ought to. You know, we aren't called to think how wonderful we are. We never sing hymns that, how great am I? We sing, we sing hymns that are, how great thou art. The glory is not to us. The glory is to God. So don't be conceited. Don't be the person who thinks you've arrived. But also apply it this way. Don't push people's buttons on purpose. Because that's what it is to provoke. Now, if your button gets pushed, don't blame someone else for you having the button because you still need to let God heal that purpose. But don't go around pushing people's buttons just for the fun of it. <laughs> Envying one another. Desiring what other people have. So, friends, in Christ, we have been set free from the sinful desires of the flesh. Sinful desires and passions are out there. Sin is out there. It will call you. The tempter will use it. But you say no when he says no. Because you're free from all of that. We know by experience that the pleasures are, of sin are but for the moment. And the heartache can be a whole life. So we say no, because God knows what's best for us. Life is all about keeping in step with the Spirit. To walk with God. 
I read about Moses and I love how it closes out at the end of Deuteronomy. And he goes, he was one like no other friend who spoke face to face. Do you realize you got something Moses never had? God living in you. No pillar of cloud and no pillar of fire that separated. But you've been invited into a dynamic, responsive relationship with his indwelling life. He says, just stay in step with me. Because you and I have been liberated from a selfish existence so that we can give ourselves selflessly and sacrificially so our lives can be what Christ is in expressing agape to a hurting world. Father, I pray that you would make it be our true passion and desire the hunger of our hearts to live in harmony with you, our Savior, our Lord, our life itself. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You all stand up real quick and I'll pray a blessing on that. Lord, we stand before you as your beloved children and we confess that we are not our own. We belong to you and our hearts are full of gratitude that you knew everything about us and you chose us and you love us and you live in us. Lord, may you work in transforming each one into your image so that this hurting world would experience Jesus being expressed through each of us. So that when you say no, we say no. When you say go, we go. And whatever you want to give, we give. When you say let go, we let go because we belong to you. Lord, make it be. Hey, I love you. Have a great week.